What's up, y'all? It's Celeste. About two and a half months ago, I discovered that I have ankyloglossia, aka tongue tie. So in this video, I want to explain what that is and what the um, effects of it are, why it matters, and what I'm going to do about it. And I've kind of been putting this video off a little bit because it's kind of overwhelming. There's a lot of information that I want to share and a lot of things I feel like I have to explain. So I have this kind of mental outline with all these bullets and sub bullets and stuff. And I have an actual outline, which is a little bit less uh, detailed, but kind of like a broader version of that. Um, so I'm going to try to make sure I touch on everything and it's a little hard to explain some of this stuff because it all kind of ties in with each other. So part of what I've struggled with is kind of figuring out like the order to explain things in. So I might be kind of jumping around from thing to thing and then like going back to certain things and it might seem kind of weird, but I will do my best to explain everything as much as I can. Um, so the first three things I just want to explain right off. So first I want to just kind of as briefly as possible explain what tongue tie is. Like I said, I'm going to go into more of the kind of details and effects of it in a little bit, but um, just the basic kind of definition of what it is. Um, everybody has a frenum or frenulum under their tongue. Frenum and frenulum are kind of used interchangeably. Frenulum actually just means little frenum, but like I said, they're kind of used they're both used for all, all the exact same things, so I don't know why there are two words. But anyway, um, there's a piece of connective tissue under your tongue called a frenulum that attaches the bottom of your tongue to the floor of your mouth. And there are other frenums or frenulums throughout your body. There are some other ones in your mouth as well. Um, and basically what it does is it kind of tethers some part of your body that is mobile, like your tongue, which can move around, it kind of tethers it a little bit in so that it doesn't just like kind of go crazy and go all over the place where it has no control and like goes out too far and, you know, stretches too far. It's basically just like to kind of keep everything in line a little bit. So it's supposed to be there. It has a function, but um, it's supposed to be thin and long and like allow for full mobility. For some people, like myself, apparently, um, it is either too thick or too short or a combination of those things, or just depending on where it attaches, it prevents you from having full mobility of that part of your body. There's kind of a historical or traditional idea of what tongue tie is that is a lot narrower than what it turns out to be. So if you have actually heard of this before, or if you are familiar with it at all, then you've probably heard of it in... Um, relation to infants and little tiny children um, because it's usually, at least historically, this kind of stereotypical idea of what tongue tie is, um, is usually caught in infancy because it can impact the child's ability to breastfeed, um, speech, and swallowing, eating, all of this kind of stuff. So it can cause some pretty major problems and that's why it's usually caught in infancy and, um, or I should say, the kind that is caught, the kind that has historically been caught at all has been caught in infancy. Um, and there's this kind of traditional idea of what tongue tie looks like, and it's kind of this really obvious tongue tie where the frenulum attaches like at the tip of the tongue and it's very short, and so a lot of times the front of the tongue will actually look kind of heart-shaped because the middle of the tongue is being pulled down, like kind of cinched down by the frenulum, and that makes the front of the tongue kind of look like this. Um, and that's kind of been the traditional thing. So a lot of dentists and ENTs and other doctors, pediatricians, whoever, um, who have diagnosed it in the past, who have like known the diagnostic criteria, have been going on a lot of visual information. And then again, like I said, um, specifically if the baby has trouble breastfeeding or something like that, then they'll probably look at it. But um, it's basically been kind of a a thing where they just went by if it was really obvious, and if it wasn't, then they figured there wasn't a problem and nothing to worry about. Um, so it turns out that that's not actually the entire story, and that you can actually have a frenulum that causes restriction even if it's not as obvious. So it doesn't have to be as easily visible. And it also doesn't have to prevent mobility entirely for it to be obvious. So I haven't really had any speech problems throughout my life. I never had trouble breastfeeding. I never had trouble eating or swallowing or anything like that. Um, 
So there was no reason for anybody to think that I had tongue tie. And um, it's actually a fairly recent development that the diagnostic criteria has been changing. And it's not even a thing that has changed throughout. Like, it's not like all doctors even know this yet because this research is so new. Um, and it is kind of being spearheaded, especially by one doctor in particular. Um, his name is Dr. Zaghi and he's in California. He went to Harvard. He, he went to Stanford and like UCLA and he's like pretty legit guy. So, um, he's not just like some random, like fly by night, like quack doctor or anything. Um, he actually knows what he's talking about. He's an ENT and sleep surgeon, and I'll get more into why that's relevant in just a little bit. But um, basically, he, he and his team have done a lot of research um, specifically on older children and adults because most of the research has been on infants, and there are some other uh, prominent doctors who are continuing to do research on infants and babies. But he's kind of like the main guy for not babies. And um, a lot of his recent research just from the last few years has shown that um, tongue tie is not just a visually diagnosable thing, that um, it actually is more about function. And so the criteri criteria that he uses um, is based on function and mobility. And based on that, uh, I actually do have a tongue tie. The second thing I want to, to mention is that the resting posture of your tongue should be on the roof of your mouth. So the tip of your tongue should be behind your teeth, not touching your teeth, like a little bit behind your teeth. And then the whole rest of the tongue should be up against your palate. It shouldn't be resting on the bottom of your mouth. It shouldn't be hanging out in the middle of your mouth. It should be on the top of your mouth. Obviously when you're actively using your tongue, like speaking and eating and things like that, then it will be moving all around. But when you're at rest, it should be up there. And number three is that you should be breathing through your nose essentially all of the time. Um, obviously there are situations where you actually can't breathe through your nose and that's why you're able to breathe through your mouth, but you shouldn't really be breathing through your mouth um, much if at all, like as little as possible. So there's kind of this cultural joke or insult about being a mouth breather. Mouth breather. And our idea of that is like, somebody that's really dumb, somebody that is like, I don't know, just like not, not socially with it or whatever. Um, but it's not really about that so much as actual physiological function. And it's another thing that is maybe not as obvious as you might think. A lot of people think that they're breathing through, through their nose and don't consider themselves to be a mouth breather, so to speak but are actually breathing through either their mouth and their nose, or they have their mouth open and are like breathing through it without realizing it, or all these kinds of things. And I think this is the category that I fell into because I, or I still fall into, I um, didn't consider myself to be a mouth breather. Um, and I actually have been working on breathing through my nose specifically for like a couple years because I've been working on breathing in general for a couple years since I started taking singing lessons. I've gotten really focused on it and um, also like using it for anxiety and all this other kind of stuff. So breathing has been a huge thing for me for like two to three years. And um, it's kind of interesting in singing instruction, there's actually some like mixed messaging about breathing through your nose or your mouth or both or whatever. Some people say only breathe through your nose. Some people say breathe through wherever you can to get the most air. Um, and that's not actually a great idea. You should be breathing through your nose as much as possible. Why should you be breathing through your nose? There are a number of reasons. Um, first of all, breathing through your mouth, you're basically just like sucking in a huge amount of air that is just going straight into your throat and then down into your lungs. It isn't really getting warmed or moistened or filtered or all of the other good things that breathing through your nose does. So breathing through your nose, um, you have all these hairs inside your nostrils that help filter. Then once it gets in there, it actually, it's not like your nose, you breathe through your nose and it just like goes through this tube like straight down into your lungs. That's kind of what happens with your mouth, but with your nose, there are actually all of these intricate curves and turns, and it's basically like this labyrinth of tissue and bone inside your nasal cavity that all of the air has to go through. And by doing that, it actually gets 
um, filtered and kind of like the pressure of it is changed and the temperature of it is changed, it's moistened. And all of this is way more conducive to health for a number of reasons. Um, it increases the amount of nitric oxide, not to be confused with nitrous oxide. Nitric oxide is actually a really important part of breathing because it basically maximizes the amount of oxygen that is that goes into the bloodstream from what you're breathing. I think those are like the main things about breathing that I wanted to mention. Um, I may touch on it again in a little bit. There's actually a book that was just written about breathing recently. It's I think called Breath maybe um, by James Nestor. I will link to it in the description. Um, I haven't actually read it yet, but um, I've listened to a few podcasts that James Nestor has been on as a guest and he's explained a lot of the stuff that's in his book and it really coincides a lot with a lot of the stuff I'm talking about in this. So again, this is not something specific just to tongue tie. This is not just an issue for like a few people with medical problems. Like this is actually a like pretty widespread thing that everybody can learn from. Even if you already are pretty much a nose nasal breather, like there's still a lot to kind of improve upon, I think. Um, some habits that we probably all could uh, benefit from learning more about. So um, I will link that in the description if you want to learn more about all of that. Those are the three foundational pieces that I wanted to mention. And like I said, I will be kind of jumping back to these a little bit as I go on, but I feel like it would have been a little bit more confusing if I had just tried to explain these as I went. So I don't know if anything that I just mentioned up to this point has blown your mind yet, but um, some of you it probably has because a lot of people are not breathing through their noses. A lot of people do not have their tongue in their correct resting posture. So now I'm going to show you my frenulum and um, you can see for yourself what it looks like. So as you can see, my frenulum doesn't attach at the tip of my tongue. It's maybe about a third of the way back. And then on the floor of my mouth, it actually goes through my salivary glands and then attaches there. And um, from the side, you can see that it's kind of this big wall of connective tissue that actually goes back pretty deep. So in my case, what this means is that I can lift the tip of my tongue up to the roof of my mouth like that, but I can't actually get the entire rest of my tongue up. Like I physically literally cannot do it. So the correct tongue posture that I should be having all of the time is literally impossible for me because I physically, my tongue physically can't get there because it's being held down by this connective tissue. Um, so especially when I open my mouth, like if I, my mouth is closed, I can get a lot of it up there. Like a decent amount, but still not the very back of it. And um, when my mouth is open, I can barely get any of it. And in fact, even the tip of my tongue, when my mouth is open all of the way, um, I can get the tip of my tongue all the way up to what is commonly known as the spot, um, which is the place where the tip of your tongue rests behind your teeth, but again, not touching your teeth. But the only reason I can actually do that is because I'm also lifting the floor of my mouth and also compensating with some other muscles like in my neck and shoulders. And it turns out that you shouldn't actually have to do that to get your tongue up to the roof of your mouth. You should be able to just lift your tongue. And I didn't know that. So I didn't know that I was doing anything unusual or that I was compensating because compensation is kind of the double-edged sword of the body. It is this amazing thing that bodies are able to do that um, the body figures out like what it needs to do and it just figures out some way to achieve that even if there are things in the way um, of the way that it normally would function. And that's great because it allows us to do a lot of things that we wouldn't be able to do if we were restricted to a very limited, like singular way to do anything with our bodies. But the downside is that sometimes the ways that it comes up with to achieve those things is kind of hacky and um, causes a lot of problems with other stuff throughout the rest of the body. And because the body does this with so many things, we aren't even aware of it a lot of the time. Like, I wasn't aware that lifting the tongue up to the roof of your mouth shouldn't feel like a lot of tension in your neck and it shouldn't feel like all of this tension up under your chin and like, I didn't know that because I've never felt anything different. So how would I know that? Like if nobody told me. So the way to check for this other than just looking or feeling and seeing if there's any tension is to actually take your fingers and put them on the floor of your mouth to hold it down and then see if you can get the tip of your tongue up. And I can't, as you can see. So 
Um, even though it looked like I had tongue mobility, I actually don't. And this is one of the things that Dr. Zagi and his team have been kind of figuring out over the last several years that um, even functionality is not necessarily like it can be deceiving because there are compensations that can happen and there are other things that can happen that can kind of obscure the issues that a person might have with mobility or with functionality. So I can't get my tongue up to the roof of my mouth. Why does it matter if your tongue is actually up on the roof of your mouth? Why is this supposed to be your resting tongue posture? There are a number of reasons um, and it actually kind of goes back all the way to when you are developing. And um, basically the tongue is supposed to be up on the roof of your mouth and it is First of all, by being up on the palate, it's actually like stimulating stem cells to be um, created and basically like uh, impacting the actual ways that things are growing there. But then structurally what it does is it actually creates um, like outward pressure on your teeth or where your teeth will go. And meanwhile, your cheeks are creating inward pressure for the same thing. So what that does is it creates this kind of stability of this balanced pressure that enables your teeth to form in the proper formation, which is like an arch shape. If you imagine like an arch on its side, then you can imagine like the kind of half circle-ish of the teeth um, on the top of your mouth, which is called the maxilla. Basically, the tongue being up there allows the teeth to go in the right place and not just the teeth but like the actual jaw it allows the jaw to grow in the right shape if it's not there then the pressure from the cheeks is still coming in but there's nothing to counteract it so that makes everything kind of like uh, there's nothing really holding everything together and basically that is a big reason for crowded teeth crowded mouth um if you like me, have ever been told that your teeth are too big for your mouth, that your teeth are too crowded for your mouth. Um, it's actually not that your teeth are too big for your mouth, it's that your mouth is too small for your teeth. And the reason for that is because of how it has grown. And the tongue is not the only aspect of this. There are other things like, um, this is actually something that's still kind of being researched a lot, but there's also some evidence that it has to do with when humans started farming and doing agriculture, in like an industrialized kind of way and um, we started eating more grain and basically just like changed our whole diet and like a lot of other cultural stuff and that has happened over time um, changed things about how we use our mouths and chew and things like that so um, I'm not gonna get into all of that too much because that's pretty much the extent of what I know about it but um, anyway even the tongue posture thing is not exclusive to people with tongue tie. Um, a lot of people have poor resting tongue posture just from habit and um, other stuff. So it's not something that only affects people with tongue tie. And if you don't have tongue tie, then you can actually like retrain your tongue to be in the right posture. And there's actually this whole kind of like subculture of people who do this. And it's often called mewing because um, there there's a father and son dentists, they're both dentists, in the UK, um, whose last name is Mew, M-E-W, and they are the ones who kind of have popularized this. And so if you ever go online and see anybody talking about mewing, this is what they're talking about. And I actually first saw something about this like a couple years ago, um, again, through like stuff that I was like looking at and reading about singing because I was looking at all this stuff about like mouth anatomy and tongue tension and all this kind of stuff. And um, that's when I first found out about it. But the problem with it is a lot of the kind of subculture around it is like a lot of incels and other people like that who see this whole jaw shape thing more as like an aesthetic thing that it's about like having like aesthetics that are more attractive, like through like evolutionary biology and like all of this kind of stuff about like attracting a mate and stuff like that and not that there's anything wrong with wanting to be attractive but just the way that it is framed a lot of the time is like I said in this kind of incel way that is really creepy and very off-putting to me so since that was mostly the kind of stuff that I had seen about it I was like I didn't like entirely discount it as being a thing that maybe was important but 
Um, it seemed like it was mostly just about like being attractive and stuff. And it didn't really talk that much about functionality or like health and stuff, which would have been probably more interesting to me. Um, so I had it kind of in the back of my mind and like, I actually have been already working on trying to keep my tongue up a little bit, but, um, like I said, if you have a tongue tie like I do, you actually can't do that. So even though I've been trying to do that, I haven't really felt like I've been completely able to and it's been kind of frustrating. So anyway, I'm just mentioning all that because in case you go and look this up and you come across a lot of that stuff, which you probably will come across some of it at least, um, I'm just kind of warning you about that because I, I don't want you to entirely discount it and think that it's just some weird like incel Reddit thing that is because it's, that's not all it is. There is a, an actual like reason to do this. Um, so the crowded teeth thing is that's like um, part of it that's more obvious. But again, that is often seen in our society as an aesthetic thing. Orthodontics are seen as, as an aesthetic thing. It's about like having straight teeth because that's attractive and not because it's an indicator of issues that you might be having. Um, so basically what happens when when the when the tongue isn't there properly and when everything is kind of like not growing properly, um, it makes that space, your palate space, narrower. And because it's narrower, it is also taller because basically what happens is not everything in your head just automatically resizes to fit when certain things don't grow properly. So everything is kind of like in there, it's supposed to grow a certain way, and when other things are shifted around or like not where they're supposed to be, the other stuff doesn't really know that. So it just like grows the way it's normally supposed to do, or at least tries to. So um, because that palette is narrower, there's still like the same amount of like palette tissue there and things that need to be there. So basically what happens is it just kind of like goes like that. And what that means is the roof of your mouth is also the floor of your nose. So if you basically think of it like a two-story house, if you imagine you have like a living room on your first floor and it has an eight foot ceiling and you want it to be a 12 foot ceiling and you knock out the ceiling and like raise it up four feet and then like add the ceiling again, your second story is now going to be four feet shorter than it was before, right? Like that's just how it would work unless you then go up and raise the, raise the roof on um, the second story. Um, and obviously that's not happening in, in our head. Like the top of our skull doesn't just like grow up to like, not everything just doesn't like grow up to accommodate that. Everything accommodates it as much as possible inside your head, but like there's a limit to it. So if your palate is really narrow and tall, what that actually does is it actually ends up like cutting into your nasal passageway. And obviously like all this stuff I'm talking about is like on a spectrum. It's not like you either have a normal palette or a narrow palette. Like there's a lot of variation. And so um, the effects that it can have also have a lot of variation. So in my case, I actually do have a slightly narrow palette, but it's not as narrow as a lot of people's. So I don't have as much of a problem with my nasal passages being obstructed. Basically my palette is just like slightly too narrow for my tongue to fit there. Um, and actually if I, Try to put my tongue there like do it as much as i can you can actually see that it kind of spills over onto my teeth and then when i take my tongue down you can actually see there's a little bit of scalloping on the sides of my tongue which is where it's kind of like now been shaped that way from being in the mold of my teeth so if you have scalloping on your tongue like that that might be another indicator that you don't have enough palate space traditional orthodontics actually kind of compound this problem because it tries to solve the problem of having a mouth that's too small for all of the teeth by making the mouth even smaller. And the reason that this happens is because if you think about that like arch of your teeth, again, it's like on its side, but like if you imagine it being an arch, like a stone arch, and you have this stone arch, and then you remove two of the stones from it, as is often done in orthodontics, a lot of people have their four bicuspids removed which I definitely did. Um, and then you have braces to fit everything back together. Once you remove two stones from an arch, it necessarily is a smaller arch. Like that's just literally like the only way it could physically happen. 
So this is one of the things that kind of blew my mind when I learned about it. Um, even though it seems really obvious now in retrospect that like obviously if you remove things and then shove them together like it's going to be smaller and it seems like pretty obvious that that would make the problem even worse but I don't know I guess I just never really thought about it because it's so common and it's just like the, the way that it's done that um, I guess I just never really questioned it. So I'm not out to like vilify orthodontics or say that all orthodontists are evil or anything like that. Um, I think orthodontists are like just going by what they were taught and stuff but um, I think there's now like more evidence and information that makes it clear that maybe that's not the best way to go about things and um, there actually are there's actually this kind of like niche subset of orthodontists and dentists out there who are actually reversing the uh, pr previous orthodontics and actually putting in expanders, palate expanders, and things that actually recreate those spaces from the teeth that were extracted. And then a lot of times people have um, implants put in to replace them. So for me, the lateral kind of making everything smaller and making my palate narrow and everything, um, it did have an impact, but it's not as much of an impact for me as the other way that it actually happens is front to back, or the sagittal plane, it's sometimes called, um, where it actually, because the the arch, because it makes it smaller this way as well, what happens is all of this stuff in the back of your head, again, is still there. It still needs to take up all of this, like, tissue, space, surface area somehow. Um, and it's like now compressed into a smaller area. So what that actually does is like shove everything back. Um, and one thing that it does is your jaw um, is actually like, because it's, it's attached here at your TMJ and then it like fits into your top teeth, your bottom teeth fit into your top teeth. Um, and mine do, like I have a great bite and everything. Um, because of the orthodontics that I had, like, it looks great, and it is, like, the teeth part of it is functionally great. But because your jaw fits into your um, skull in this way, um, in order for the teeth to fit together um, up here, like, once that happens, if this is being pulled back, then this necessarily has to be pulled back as well. And what that kind of does is it pushes everything back, like it pushes the jaw up into the TMJ, which is the temporomandibular joint. Um, and it's supposed to be not obviously like super loose in there, but like it's not supposed to be like really tight. And um, if you have this kind of like retracted jaw, it ends up being tight there because it's more constricted. It's in a smaller space and there's just not as much like you imagine the joint like this. It's supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to have room to, to move. But if it's like this, it can't do that as much. Now, mine isn't like super terrible. It's not like I have constant TMJ pain or anything, but I have had a problem with TMJ and I have teeth grinding and clenching and all of this stuff. Um, so this part is an issue for me. And the other thing that it affects is your airway because like I said, everything gets pushed back and your pharynx, which is your throat space basically, um, actually is made smaller once everything gets pushed back because there's not room for it anymore. So having a smaller airway is um, obviously not great for breathing all of the time, but the time when it's probably most apparent is when you're sleeping, and that happens when you are snoring or have sleep apnea. And basically what happens is um, obstructive sleep apnea is like, it means that your airway is obstructed and you are trying to gasp for air because you are not getting enough air. And um, the reason that it happens more when you're sleeping is, first of all, because you're more relaxed. Second of all, especially if you're sleeping on your back, your tongue kind of like flops back into the back of your throat. And part of that is because if you don't have proper tongue posture and don't have good like tone in, your, in the muscle of your tongue, and your tongue is actually eight different muscles and it's enormous. If you don't work it out properly, basically it gets flabby like any other muscle would. And um, some of this can be because you have like just poor resting tongue posture and you just don't use your tongue the way that you like could be doing it to kind of work it out. Um, and the other reason is if you're like me and you have tongue tie, then you literally can't 
move all of your tongue so there's no way for you to work it out because if you imagine like trying to do a bicep curl while your arm was being held in this position like or even like in this amount of position like I would never be able to do a bicep curl that way so I would never be able to to gain any strength or tone in this part of my bicep um, and it's the same thing with your tongue so if you have restriction of your tongue you can't move it around all of the way you can do like you know the day-to-day -day stuff that you need to do or at least like I was able to um, but so I didn't know that I didn't have full mobility of my tongue because how would I know that so if your tongue is flabby it's kind of in the back of your throat it's kind of pushing into that airway and blocking it where it should be on the roof of your mouth and you should be nasal breathing over it in the nasal passageway. Um, the other thing is that if your airway is smaller, um, a lot of times people, again, compensate because that's what the body does by having more of a forward head posture. And um, forward head posture is a big problem for people in Western society in general anyway, like even aside from um, people who have tongue tie or tongue posture. Um, because of the fact that we're like over our devices all the time and over the computer and we're always like looking at things ahead of us and we don't spend a lot of time doing anything else. Um, I know it might seem kind of weird, like of course we're looking ahead of us because that's where our eyes are, but um, if we were out like in nature in the wild, we would be doing a lot more kind of in a 360 degree like world, um, whereas right now in our modern culture we spend a lot of time looking at screens and that's all right in front of us or like driving and looking in front of our steering wheel and you know everything is just kind of forward and we're not really doing a lot that has to do with around us other than you know if we're doing something specifically like a sport or you know like running around or whatever like just in our everyday lives we spent a lot of time focused forward, especially forward and down if we're on our phones or whatever, um, or down, you know, the keyboard. So everything is kind of like hunched over, pulled forward um, for cultural reasons. But even in addition to that, um, the head, I'm going to turn here so you can see, um, I don't have like super terrible forward head posture. And a lot of that is because I've actually been working on it for a long time because of all this other stuff I just mentioned of cultural stuff, like I already knew about it. So I've been working on it, but um, my normal head posture is a little bit forward. And it's like when I breathe that way, like it's like, it feels like normal breathing. If I take my head back to be in proper alignment, which would be like my ears over my shoulders, it actually feels very restricted here. Like I feel like I'm being choked. And if I'm lying on my back, it especially feels that way because I feel like I'm being choked and then I feel like my tongue is like even pushing into it more. So it's not like I can't breathe at all on my back. Um, and I actually sleep on my back quite, quite a bit of the time, but a lot of the times I'll be sleeping on my back, but I'll have my head like over to the side. And that's because like that creates a lot more airspace for me. But basically that's why sleep is kind of the main place where this becomes more apparent because when you're standing up, you can have forward head posture and you know you can do all this stuff to kind of compensate for it whereas when you're on your back or like obviously when you're on your side it's not as much but um when you're on your back it just gravity pulls everything down to the back of your head the back of your throat and that constricts the airway even more so sleep apnea and snoring are very common with people who have smaller mouths and tongue tie and this is why I was diagnosed with sleep apnea in 2007. I had a sleep study done then, and it was found that I had mild sleep apnea. It was within the range, so I qualified for sleep apnea, but it was mild enough that I decided I didn't want to have to use a CPAP, and so I just kind of like declined that and never got treated for it in any way. Um, my mom has a CPAP, and it just seemed like just awful. I just didn't want to have to mess with that. Um, I have recently found out that the more, like, the newer versions of CPAP machines are like way better and not as awful as the ones that were around back then. But anyway, that's why I never really did anything about it. Um, my sleep apnea, like I said, it was kind of mild anyway, but I even like from a kind of subjective point of view, um, I never thought it was really that bad in terms of like anybody 
who I was ever in a room sleeping with, um, like never said that I would like be gasping for air all the time or anything. Like if I'm around my mom who falls asleep or even my dad who was not diagnosed with sleep apnea but probably has it, um, like they'll be like gasping for air and it's very obvious. I don't think I really do that very much, um, but I do snore, not constantly, but kind of off and on. And I always have since I was little, even when I was like tiny and undersized and very small. But the bigger problem I've had with sleep is just not feeling rested. Like even when I would sleep a lot, I would not feel rested. And um, this year I've had more trouble sleeping at all, um, kind of off and on. I felt like I had a really good sleep schedule and then just with all the stress of everything um, this year and other like physical, like chronic pain that I've had, it's kept me up or like woken me up in the middle of the night. And so I would feel like I was never sleeping through the night and um, I had a lot of trouble with that. So I started, um, I decided to go back to get another sleep study done and I had it done. I did a, a home sleep study and that supposedly showed that I don't have sleep apnea. So I haven't actually gone to that doctor for a follow up yet. It's next week. Um, but I just like, so I haven't gotten the actual report yet, so I don't know what they found yet. But, um, that one, it was kind of interesting because since it was a home sleep study, it didn't check for nearly as much as they did in the full, like, lab sleep study. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what they found or what it tracked or whether I should really rely on that as, like, a, an accurate assessment of my sleep. Another common thing that afflicts people with tongue tie and airway problems is enlarged tonsils. Because, um, again, breathing through your nose filters the air, it warms the air, it moistens the air. Breathing through your mouth doesn't do those things. The tonsils actually function in, like, function to help filter toxins out of air and things that you eat. So, um, if you're breathing in all of this air and breathing it through your mouth, then your tonsils are kind of overloaded because they are trying to filter out way more air than they're really designed to do. It's also a bunch of cold air and dry air that is not like what you're supposed to be breathing. So they get really inflamed and um, it's just like, basically like they just get kind of overloaded and don't really get a break because they are just like bombarded with all this cold, dry air that is like toxin filled. And um, so having enlarged tonsils is very common. I definitely had enlarged tonsils and I was constantly having swollen tonsils. I was constantly getting sick. I wasn't even really sick, but I would always have like a sore throat and would just feel sick because of like, I would have this like basically like immune response. And um, I finally had my tonsils out in college and it was like, really fast I stopped getting all of those infections and it was much better. So I'm glad that I had them out but obviously that didn't solve the problem because the problem wasn't the tonsils. The tonsils were responding to the problem so they were actually like that was actually an indicator of a bigger problem. But of course I didn't know that at the time and neither did my ENT. I already mentioned TMJ but um, in addition to TMJ which is like pain and like clicking and stuff of the actual temporomandibular joint. Um, a lot of people who have TMJ also have headaches or neck pain, shoulder pain. And the reason for that is because the tension that is created in one part of your body um, often kind of spills over into other areas. And it's because, well, it's kind of multifaceted. Part of it is because a lot of times they share nerves. Part of it is because when you start pulling on things that are connected to each other, they kind of necessarily are affected. Um, and um, obviously it seems pretty obvious, I think, that you know if you have tension here, that it's not super crazy that you might have tension here or like down here or whatever, because they're pretty close together, right? What might be more surprising, and this was very surprising to me, although it completely makes sense, is that having tension in your tongue, having a tongue tie can actually cause tension all the way down to your toes. And this is like super like crazy sounding, I know. But basically the tongue tie, the frenulum is connective tissue and it's largely fascia. And if you don't know what fascia is, it's basically this like mesh framework throughout your entire body that is 
kind of like the structure of your body. It, it like kind of connects everything. It holds everything together. Um, not that everything would like spill out without it, but it's like, I don't know. It's just like this kind of stabilizer and connector. And, you know, it's part of when your body forms to begin with, it's there to kind of create a structure and scaffolding. And, and it, it serves a number of different functions, but that's part of it. And the fascia throughout your entire body is connected. It's like, it's not one piece. It's, it's all, you know, different pieces. Like it's all connective tissue. So it's all kind of connected. It's all kind of one thing, but it's not like one solid piece is what I'm saying. Um, and there are actually different lines of it. They're called, um, one of which is called the deep front line of the fascia. And basically it's like certain things are, certain parts are attached to different parts. And it's kind of this, not quite Rube Goldberg machine, but like, you know, this kind of, um, cause and effect like chain of of uh connection that basically like interacts in a certain way that is functional for your body that's the best way i can think to explain it so the deep front line of the fascia actually i can't remember exactly where it starts it's somewhere like up in the top of your head but it includes the tongue and then it goes down through your larynx and some of your neck muscles your heart and lungs your diaphragm your psoas, a bunch of other core muscles in your back and abdomen, um, pelvic floor, a whole bunch of your adductors, which are your inner thighs, and then behind your knees, down your calves, and around your ankles, and then all the way to your feet and then your toes. There's actually a really cool video um, that's super fascinating of a dissection that was done of the deep front line of the fascia. And um, I'm either going to like try to include a clip here or I'll just link to it, but um, just to kind of give you an idea of what to expect here. It is a dissection, but it's not like they just like cut somebody open and they're like pulling stuff out. It is like they've already removed this from the body. It's like there's not a person there. It's just this part of the body has already been removed. There's, it's not bloody. It's not wet or like there's not like liquid or um, bodily fluids or anything like that. It's just like kind of like brown meat, basically, um, which is kind of gross, I know, but it's not quite as gross, at least not to me, by my personal um, barometer of squickiness. Um, so I found this incredibly fascinating, but it actually illustrates how all these things are connected and how affecting one part of it can affect other parts of it. So I highly recommend that if you think you can handle it because it's really, really cool. So a lot of people who have tongue tie actually have tension in a lot of these other places in their bodies which is really fascinating. Like there's a huge overlap. It's like probably maybe not hundred percent, but like almost everybody that I've ever seen. And I'm like now of course in like Facebook groups and stuff for people who have tongue tie. Um, a lot of people who have tongue tie have chronic tension in other parts of their body that it's not just tension where you're like you're tensing it up. It's like, it literally is constricted. Like you can't relax it. You can't, um, you just can't like override it basically. Um, at least not in any kind of lasting way. Like you might be able to stretch it, you know, for a little bit, but then like as the day goes on, you kind of like go back to being constricted. And I definitely have a lot of chronic tension. I've actually been working on it all year long um, in a number of different ways, including going to physical therapy. And I'm going to be making a whole another video on that in the future. But just kind of briefly, I have had a lot of trouble with plantar fasciitis with, I have like low flat arches, flat feet and tight calves and tight adductors, um, like diaphragm and like kind of my whole core basically is, is chronically tight and chronically tight shoulders and neck and head, of course. So I've had headaches and migraines basically my entire life. This is also very, very common among people who have tongue tie. Part of that is the tension. Part of it is because of constricted airway and not getting enough oxygen and also like the fact that moving all this stuff around in the skull and like the shape of everything developing um, also impacts the shape of the sinuses. So it actually can like cause more sinus congestion um, and just a lot of different things like that. So um, headaches are another indicator and that's definitely something I've dealt with my whole life. And in addition to physical tension, um, it's also really common for people who have tongue tie to have anxiety and depression and trouble with focus and concentration and brain fog and you know, all kinds of mental health stuff, um, cognitive stuff. Like most of the stuff I'm talking about here, it's probably 
for a number of reasons. Um, one is the physical tension probably, you know, there's probably like a feedback loop where having physical tension kind of leads you to have more emotional tension because it kind of indicates to the body that things are stressful. Um, another thing is by impacting our sleep. Um, sleep is extremely important for mental and cognitive health and um, not getting enough sleep can definitely impact your mental health and ability to think and concentrate and all that. Um, and then the other thing is breathing because um, first of all, not getting enough oxygen can also have an impact on those things. And also one of the other functions of mouth breathing is because you're not really supposed to be mouth breathing, um, it actually also kind of puts the body in a state of fight or flight. Nasal breathing is um, has a calming effect. It's um, This is all connected to like the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. Um, and Mouth breathing, it's not like you automatically, like you mouth breathe and then you're like automatically having a very obvious panic attack. It's more like this kind of low level, like stress that you probably don't even notice, especially if you're kind of chronically breathing through your mouth. So basically it just kind of increases the amount of anxiety that you have by keeping your nervous system in this stressed out state. Also, if you've heard of the vagus nerve, which you might have if you follow any like mental health or self-care or trauma or whatever kind of stuff, um, it's kind of a big buzzword in those spaces right now. So um, the vagus nerve has a lot of different functions, but one of the things that it impacts is um, regulation of stress, basically. And um, there is part of the vagus nerve is actually in the palate. So when your tongue is up in the correct spot, and especially like your, the tip of your tongue is up in that spot, you're actually stimulating the vagus nerve and that can actually create a sense of calm. Um, and I've seen it kind of postulated that that might be one of the reasons for um, thumb sucking, that in addition to like obviously it being kind of a holdover from pacifier and um, nipples and stuff, um, that it's actually like the child or whoever trying to kind of calm themselves. So thumb sucking is also kind of common in, um, com thumb sucking and oral habits of in general are common for people who have tongue tie. And um, I never really, really was a big thumb sucker. I'm, maybe when I was like really small or something, but I was a nail biter for my entire life. I actually just quit like a couple, maybe like two and a half years ago. And I've kind of regressed a little bit this year because of so much stress, but um, I mostly have, I'm still considering myself to have quit. So I thought that was interesting because obviously nail biting is often um, associated with stress, but um, it's not always obvious, like why would you bite your nails? Like what good would that do? Um, but if it does, in fact, stimulate the vagus nerve, then that would actually make a little bit of sense. There's one other thing I wanted to mention um, as far as like effects that tongue tie has had for me, and that is my voice. Even though I haven't really had any speech problems, it has affected my voice, um, and mostly with singing. And so I, I started to talk about that in this video and then realized that I had a lot to say about it. So I'm actually going to make a separate video about that. So um, I just wanted to mention it here just so you'll know that that's coming, but um, I'm not going to get into it really right this second, but um, just keep that in mind as, as something else that it can impact. So I'm actually going to have to make a separate video for the treatment that I'm going to be having for this, um, but I will tell you what it is in this video just so like I'm not like, totally teasing you on it, but um, I there's way too much to explain about it to put it in this video because I'm sure this video is also already like super long. So. Um, I'm just going to tell you what the treatment is and then I will go into it further in the next video or in a future, hopefully very soon, video. The procedure that's done to correct tongue tie is called a phrenectomy or sometimes frenuloplasty and it basically just means that they cut the frenulum, um, often with a laser or sometimes scissors. And um, I will be explaining more about that in the, uh, the upcoming video where I talk about all of the stuff I'm getting done, but that is one of the things that I'm going to be getting done. Leading up to that, and then for quite a while afterward, there's something called orofacial myofunctional therapy, um, which basically just means um, the muscle function of the mouth and face therapy, which is, um, it's all, it's not like physical therapy, like they're actually touching you. It is, mine, mine's actually being done over Zoom, but um, it's being guided through 
learning to um, create better muscle tone in your tongue and have better mobility in your tongue. So there are certain parts of it that are done before the phrenectomy um, to help prepare you for the phrenectomy. And then the majority of it is actually done after the phrenectomy because you physically can't do all of the stuff because you don't have the mobility. But once you have the phrenectomy, you have to learn how to like use your tongue, your new tongue in this way that you couldn't previously do. So that's what the therapy is for. So I'm, I'm doing that right now. And um, then the other thing that I looked into but am probably not actually going to do is palate expansion, which I talked about a little bit. I just kind of touched on it briefly in this video, um, but that is something I looked into. So even though I'm not going to be probably pursuing that, I did have a couple of consultations about that. So I'm going to be talking about that in the other video just to kind of give you an, uh, some information about what I learned and like what my experience was with the consultations that I had. So that's what I'm going to be talking about in the next video on this. Oh my gosh, this was so much information. Um, I hope that I did a good job of explaining it. I know it's a lot. I know it's it's been quite a lot for me to absorb and I like went pretty hardcore down the rabbit hole of this whole thing for weeks and was just like obsessively learning as much as I could about it. And now I've like thrown so much of it at you in a very short ish time span. Um, so hopefully you're not too overloaded by this. Um, but um, as always, if you want clarity on any of this, if there's anything you want me to talk about more in some future videos, um, please leave, leave some comments. Let me know what, um, what you need more explanation about or what you want to hear more about about this. But hopefully I did an okay job of at least explaining kind of the basics of all of this stuff. And I don't know if your mind was blown by any of this like it was for me when I learned about it. But um, I'm sure there are at least some of you out there who are who have watched this and are like feeling a lot of resonance with what I'm saying because that's how I felt watching and reading other stuff from other people about this. And um, there are probably some other people watching this who are like, yeah, I already completely breathed through my nose and already had my tongue in the right place and I had no idea that there were people who didn't do those things. And now you know that. So hopefully no matter who you are, you learned something watching this video. If you did, or if you just thought it was a cool video, or if you just want to be nice, you can hit that like button and subscribe so you can see my future videos on this topic and others, and um, hit the notification bell so you don't miss anything. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see y'all next time.